take a holiday in the land where the palm trees sway. Your ship set sail today for the island.
uh, when we lost a dear friend of ours this year. And uh, I did want to put together something special for you guys. Obviously, a lot of us miss him. And I'd like to celebrate him tonight, so I kind of put together a little montage intro. And with the help of our friends getting the right photos, and uh, that's it. It's not about us. We're just a vessel to maybe remember Andrew, Mr. Tiki Head, everybody. <laughs> if we could, uh, like, dim the house just a little bit. And we're going to try and play along to Andrew's video that we did with him. Okay. Cue dim lights. Thank you. Cue.
palm trees sway Your ship set sail today for the island Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Stellar Shows at Jack's. This presentation of eclectic American roots is a showcase for the music and lifestyle that celebrates the origins and legacy of authentic American music. Please give generously early and often as we present this series. The proceeds go to connecting you with the eclectic American roots musicians that you love and encourages them with support through these challenging and uncertain times. And thanks to Jack's Entertainment, Stellar Shows at Jack's presents Eclectic American Roots. This week, we delve into a lot of the history and mystery around the legend of Tiki. We'll explore the exotica music made famous by the legendary Martin Denny, and we'll talk to the movers and shakers who live this cool Polynesian lifestyle. So what image comes to mind when you hear the word tiki? In ancient Polynesia, tiki carvings are a key part of the South Pacific's mythology, culture, and history. Like Adam in the Christian Bible, Polynesian mythology refers to tiki as the first man. Now the Polynesian islands are spread out over a whole lot of ocean, and there are many different Polynesian cultures, each with its own figures and mythology, paying tribute to the tiki gods. The four major tiki gods are Ku, the god of war, Lono, the god of fertility and peace, Kane, the god of light and life, and Kanaloa, the god of the sea. Many of the carved wooden tiki statues have piercing eyes and a menacing scowl, some are happy, some look sad, and some are definitely mad. Threatening expressions are used to scare away evil spirits. Those with friendlier looks are for use in religious ceremonies, healing services, and, and for good luck. Ancient followers worshiped these tiki gods through prayer, chanting, lava sledding, and even human sacrifice. What, you never heard of lava sledding? It's a traditional sport of the native Hawaiians. It's similar to wave surfing, but it's a, a narrow wooden sled that you ride down courses of lava rock on a volcano, often, often up to 50 miles an hour. It was considered both a sport and a religious ritual for honoring the tiki gods. Some of the most famous tiki statues in the world reside on Easter Island and are called Moai. Most are carved directly out of lava rock and more than 880 statues have been discovered on Rapa Nui. Each individually carved tiki statue, whether made of stone or wood, has a unique story to tell, representing aspects of ancient life. Starting in the 1930s, carvings and other Polynesian art became main focal points for tropical restaurants and tiki bars around the world. The first bar and restaurant with a focus on tiki culture actually opened in 1934. It was owned by Don Beach of Don the Beachcomber, it was just after Prohibition was repealed, and the proprietor was a young man from Texas who had done some rum running with his father and had sailed throughout much of the Pacific Ocean. The beachcomber chain eventually grew to 25 restaurants. Dining out tiki style was revolutionary in a time when people didn't usually eat outside their own culture. As exotic as the food was, it's the tropical drinks that make or break a tiki bar. Tiki restaurants walk a fine line between reality and myth, acknowledging that much of it is Hollywood fantasy, but also trying to create an atmosphere of authenticity. Adding to the glamour of tiki culture, Waikiki Wedding, a movie starring Bing Crosby and Martha Ray, was released in 1937 with the popular song, Blue Hawaii. In 1938, Her Jungle Love, starring Dorothy L'Amour, was popular. In the early 1940s, when many soldiers were returning home from World War II, the Trader Vic chain of restaurants became quite popular. Servicemen were familiar with the cuisine and the decor, and island style quickly found its way into the homes and architecture all over the United States. In 1949, James Missioner's South Pacific, a musical by Rodgers and Hammerstein, included the song Bally High, about a mystical tropical island. 
If tiki culture began as a restaurant made to look like a Hollywood set, then alcoholic drinks in elaborate barware with prodigious cocktail recipes are the cornerstones of its popularity. Don from Don the Beachcomber is also credited for creating the entire tiki drink genre with flavored syrups, fresh fruit juices, and rum, which were served in fancy glasses, hollowed out pineapples, and coconuts. The proper mix of tropical cocktails is a complicated art, and it's a challenge to find today. Creative cocktail names include the Zombie, Fog Cutter, Outrigger, Shrunken Head, and the Tropical Itch. Tiki culture also influenced the clothing choices of mainstream America. Sarong-inspired dresses became more popular with women thanks to actresses and pinup models like Dorothy L'Amour from her role in the 1937 film The Hurricane. For men, the Hawaiian shirt, originally called the Aloha shirt, is the ultimate symbol of leisure. And what a splash President Harry Truman made on the cover of Life magazine. No island outfit would be complete without the modern flower lei. It's a simple expression of affection and usually imparted to a guest upon arriving. Just as ubiquitous as the lei is the ukulele. Entire bands are devoted to the tiny instrument made famous in Hawaii. The popularity of the ukulele was made possible by King Kalakaua. A patron of the arts, he incorporated it into performances at royal gatherings. Then there was the music. Polynesian music was infused with jazz, Asian, African rhythms, and Latin, creating a hybrid sound called exotica, which Martin Denny made famous. Tiki art has its own place in the culture. Tiki style has taken hold internationally, and there are artists around the world doing top-notch art in all styles and flavors. Like tiki mugs, tiki art has fanatic collectors decorating their homes and businesses. Some collect objects of the lowly kitschy culture, due to their camp value, while others pursue items from the original Polynesian world. Nostalgia also plays a role. Older people remember the high times, while younger people remember their parents' bamboo bars and tropical parties. Today, there's more tiki activity going on than ever before. Many regional tiki shows attract thousands of aficionados for long weekends of cultural immersion. Dining, dancing, drinking, with many high-profile vendors displaying their amazing wares. Modern tiki restaurants and bars maintain their history, and some have incorporated lounges, live bands, and even thunder showers. Rum-based drinks like the Mai Tai and the Zombies still flow freely, and the tiki gods still maintain their scowling disposition. Before we meet today's host, let's dive into some authentic hula billy music. Six to nine, I'll sing you a song if you got the time. Here I am, and the sun goes down. Me and the girl laying on the ground underneath the Kiawe tree till dawn. She said to me, Hula hula, bang bang. Hula hula, bang bang. Hula hula, bang bang. And yeah, that's just what she sang. That's just what she sang. Seats in the big 
Our host for today's show is Matt Marble, also known as Spike, and he's a true mid-century modern renaissance man in every sense of the word. Spike is an accomplished graphic designer for firms like Hurley, O'Neill, and Hyundai, and he designs tiki-themed poster art as well. At the same time, the talented Spike has a fabulous photography company called Spike and the Camera. It specializes in lush pinup photography, and its models are some of the world's most beautiful. Spike's photography has been featured in marketing campaigns and on the cover of several pinup, hot rod, and fetish magazines. His home bar, The Breezeway it's called, has had over 50 different pinup photo shoots and is considered one of the best home tiki bars in the country. Many of you know him as an accomplished musician, and he formed a band called The Hula Girls in 2008 that performs all over the country at tiki bars, weekenders, and special events. They were the house band for 10 years in the Dagger Bar at Don the Beachcomber in Sunset Beach. They have played Viva Las Vegas, Tiki Oasis, The Hookalau, and stellar shows Escape to Tiki Island. Their style is up-tempo, hapa haole, tiki, and surf theme music, all filtered through the late 1950s and early 60s rockabilly sound. Spike plays guitar and lead vocals, Shorty Poole is on upright and electric bass, Gary Brandon shreds the steel guitar, and Doug Sanburn is on drums. They're always accompanied by their hula agogo dancers, Miss Haley Holiday, Miss Ginger Watson, and Miss Veronica Velvet. Spike has performed at 18 tiki bars across the country and has personally visited 54 different tiki bars. He gets around. He also has a deep love for all things mid-century. If our host, Matt Marble, is not one of the hippest guys on the tiki scene, I don't know who is. In fact, when I looked up the word hip in the dictionary, there was Matt Marble's picture. Oh, you think I'm kidding? Ladies and gentlemen, cats and kittens, warriors and wahinis, say mahalo to Matt Marble. Thank you so much, Christopher. Welcome to our show. We were talking about tiki culture and uh, with an emphasis on exotica music. and. There isn't a band that has been so prominent in the Southern California tiki scene as the Tiki Aki Orchestra. And I'd like to welcome my good friend, Mr. Jim Baki, the founder and leader of the Tiki Aki Orchestra. Hey, Jim. Aloha. Hey. Good, how you doing? Aloha. Aloha. Uh, first of all, it's good to see you. It's been uh, a little you while too. since anybody's really been out to any shows. Yeah, you got a beard now. Yeah, thank you for noticing. <laughs> and my hair has not been cut for a long time, so. I know, I've, I've been yeah. stranded on this island here for three months now. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, me too. I think that I think that you and I both were, were performing tiki music around the same time. I um, When did the, the Tiki Aki Orchestra start? I I think you were around before with, this, with the early version of the Smoke and Menahunis. Oh, right? okay, maybe so. Yeah, I... I I put the first Tikiaki record out in 2007, okay, and yeah. it was just me. We didn't. Have, there was no band yet. It was just I made a. We started in 2008, so okay. it's been 12 years now and running. So. And uh, and what what brought you to Tiki? Uh, moving to Los Angeles brought me mm -hmm. to Tiki first. Um, besides, it's really a Southern California thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and besides the fact that, you know, growing up and seeing the Brady Bunch and all that stuff, you know, and all the Hawaii Five-0 and all the, you know, tiki, tiki culture kind of invaded television at, in the 60s. So as a young yeah. kid, it was always, but I didn't really know what it was. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles in 95, and I happened into Wacko. That's a pretty cool store. And I oh, saw yeah. Tiki News. Uh -huh. And I was like, wow, there's a fanzine for this stuff? Like, Because I, I love fanzines, you know, punk rock and, 
you know, little sure. underground rock and roll fanzines. What, where did you first come across Exotica music, and uh, and what made you want to start an Exotica band? It seems like it seems like a ridiculous idea, especially um, with how many band members you have, and do you know what well, I mean? Well, yeah. Well, originally, um, let's see if I get my timeline right on this. I mean, yeah. I always liked fifty culture, even when I was back living in New York, you know, lounge music. I, when I moved here in 95, I was in a power pop band and there was a big power pop scene and like bands like the Wondermints okay. um, were playing, they would play like, I'd go see them House of Blues. You know, they were already a pretty big band. That's Brian Wilson's backing band now was guys from the Wondermints. Uh, okay. They played the instrumental Pet Sounds. And I remember reading that Pet Sounds was, Brian Wilson was really influenced by Esquivel, and those Wonderman's guys used to talk about wow. that. Yeah, so Brian Wilson was a big pe- uh, Esquivel fan, and that's where, if you listen to Pet Sounds, it's one of the two instrumentals on the record. It's kind of an Exotica song. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's very Exotica. And I saw them play it, the Wonderman's played it live, and a bunch of people got up and picked up shakers, and all because <laughs> it's a really cool song. Um, yeah. So I remember the Esquivel thing, and I sought out some Esquivel records. And then my friend had told me about, I remember, I used to live literally down the street from the Lava Lounge. So my friend told me, there's this band that they play every Sunday. They got the full Jazz Masters, the Suits, whatever. Of course, that was the Blue Hawaiians. Of course, and yeah. I, I never, I literally live right down La Brea from it. So I would always go by there like, I want to go, but I didn't have that many friends when I first moved here. No one that wanted to go. So I was, um, I'd heard about them. But oddly enough, the band I was in, we got a big record deal. I, and they were all my friends from New York. Everyone moved back to New York, and the label was based in New York. So we were, they, I was in New York a lot, even though I still lived in L.A. And I was in a record store that I used to go to when I was younger. And I heard Martini 5.0 come on, and I didn't know. I was like, who is this? And they're like, oh, it's this band, the Blue Hawaiians. I'm like, so I bought the record, and I think it's, probably one of my most played records of all time i mean i've played really? it so much i love that record it's like you know every once in a while in your musical you know career as a musician and starting out there are certain records that come out and they just set a new bar for like what is great so i have several records from different genres and that and that became the record like because sonically it's beautiful the songs yeah. are great this the sound the steel guitar you know everything um, and you know, you know that as well as I. So yeah, of um, course, yeah. Gary Brandon's a, a genius and did incredible work with with both of our music. Right, and oddly enough, that band I had the record deal with, when we made our record, I had him play on a song. I was like, I think Who, I got the good. Yeah, Gary. That's how I first. <laughs> my producer um, called him up. I said, I got this guy. He plays in this band, the Blue Hawaiians. I want lap steel guitar in just one section of this song. I think he's really great for it. And I had seen him a couple of times. And the producer uh, said, uh, it's funny because the producer was the guy named Mike Klink who produced Guns N' Roses Appetite for Destruction. You know, big guy. So he's like, I'll find him. So he did. And Gary showed up one day and, you know, Gary's very low key. He's like, okay, I just want this here. And this. So anyway, Gary played on that, that band. I was in a band called Fuzz Bubble. We were like a power pop, cheap trick Beatlesque, little Foo Fighters on the heavier side. Um, so that was my first kind of run in with Gary. And then when I was doing the, the record, um, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but I said, um, I, I, I went to see him at the Lava Lounge because I'd seen him a couple times. And I go, I have this music I'm doing. Would you be interested in playing some steel? And I was like, sure, send it to me. So that's how that happened. But as far as how I got into Exotica, the Blue Hawaiians were kind of that and Tiki News, like reading the Martin Denny, like the Blue Hawaiians were sort of the gateway. And I wrote the first song I ever wrote was My Ties on the Moon, which is the first Tiki Aki song ever. And that was my kind of like, I want to do because, you know, I, I'd gotten Pro Tools, so I was doing home recording. And I was like, I want to do, I had this idea of doing a lounge, surf lounge record on my and do everything and just see what happens you know so that's kind of how that started and uh 
when I got on Tiki Central, I was like, wow, there's a whole audience in here, like hardly any bands. So I was like, I, I can do this. I can make a record, advertise a little banner ad on the top. And that's kind of how it happened. And then the Blue Hawaiians, I started reading Tiki News and Martin Denny, Arthur Lyman. And then I started to go buy those records. And of course, I already had the Esquivel stuff. So that's kind of how I got into it. It was the Blue Hawaiians, Tiki News, Southern California, you know. thing about the the tikiaki music is that i think you approach it with a pop sensibility um whereas a lot of martin denny and arthur lyman music seems to kind of meander um your music has defined choruses and and bridges and that kind of stuff like it i think it becomes very accessible in in a very uh in a very good way yeah well i think that's uh you know if we think about the timeline of Martin Denny, it's basically pre Beatles, right? And not quite pre rock and roll, but you know, rock and roll almost died with, you know, the plane crash. So um, with Buddy Holly and, and, and the big bopper and everything. So the Beatles kind of came along and kind of redefined what rock and roll is in songwriting, pop songwriting. And that's what the music I grew up on. My older sister had the little Beatle 45s and the monk that stuff. And so pop, 60s pop is kind of ingrained in me uh so i heard the martin denny music and surf which surf is a little more defined right chorus that type of thing i think i heard the martin denny music and what i was listening to was the palette you know the music the instruments the vibraphone obviously a big part of it the percussion um and just sort of the way they arrange things because yeah he took a song and he he went so far outside of the box with the way he arranged it Sometimes it, you can't really tap your toe to it or, or hum along to it. Sometimes it's really just, and he described it himself as window dressing. So it does paint a beautiful mood. It's more atmospheric, almost horror music. And I come from writing songs with hooks and choruses. So I just took the palette of Martin Denny and sort of some of the chord voicings and structure and then just streamlined it into what I do. And it, it wasn't by design. It's just, that's the way I think. You know, so something representational of your sound. What would that song be? Uh, well, Poho Moku is a good one. Um, it's sort of probably one of the most exotic, uh, real exotic songs we have. It's very much 
uh, sort of around the quiet village model, you know, with a, 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 a repeating baseline and the changes go over that. And uh, we opened the, the Yost Theater show with that song and we had a good, nice visual to go along with it. That's probably one of the most classic Exotica songs we have. All right, well, let's take a listen to that. Thank you. 
So your band and my band have both had opportunities to play at some of the greatest tiki bars across the country. Is there a particular gig or tiki bar that was like a dream show for you? <sighs> well, the Mai Kai is an obvious first. Yeah. That's an obvious. <laughs> even though we're, we had to play all six or seven of us in that little 10 by 10 space in the back. I know, um, right? Still always amazing. But at one, when we had the full band a couple times, it was like if I moved my guitar, I was going to clunk my keyboard player in the head. Yeah, right. But the fact that you're playing and the audience is around you, in your face, and you're in that amazing environment, that I would say is one of the best ones. You know, the Contiki in Tucson was pretty cool. Okay. Um, and, of course, Trader Vic's in Emeryville. Oh, you know, wow, yeah. You know, uh, I've still never been to that Trader Vic's. It's, it's, it's pretty damn cool. It's the mothership Trader Vic's, and that particular event was the – 75th anniversary of the Mai Tai, and I think they had 700 people throughout the course of the day. It was crazy. And, of course, all the shows at Don's and yeah. Kona, when it was Kona. Yeah. Any Anytime we get to play an old, original tiki bar is the best gig ever. I know. Same. It's a it's a special experience when, when everybody's dressed up and everybody's on the same page. And, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You've done a really good job at merchandising the band. Um, I know T-shirts and stuff are, are pretty expected, but you've done a couple, at least a couple of Tiki mugs, right? Uh, yeah, I think five at this point. Oh, five wow. Six. Yeah. Squid did the, the, the bulk of the work on that. He did the logo. And he said, hey, let's do vomit bags. Let's do, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, he, he sourced a lot of that stuff. So I will give him the credit for for that. I think the as far as the theme goes, uh, that came, we were playing, we had played uh, the first song on that record, uh, Bachelor Number no. One. We were playing that before that record came out. And going back to the Mai Kai, we played a gig at the Mai Kai and we played that song at the end of it. I think Marty Lush said, you know, something about, you know, your luggage is at the gate or something like that. So that kind of went off to like, oh, airline theme. And that's where that started. Um, that was a really then, good theme. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And then Aloha Baby was the hotel. Uh, we made up this fake hotel in Waikiki and people were looking for it. It was great. But I think the merchandise thing, it's because Tiki is so art driven that the merchandise thing is a natural. Plus, I'm a Kiss fan. So yeah. there's no better merchandiser in the world than Gene Simmons. So a few <laughs> people have called me the Gene Simmons of Tiki. I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I'd want to wear that as a badge of honor, but for the merchandise part, yeah. I'm happy that you decided that you're gonna travel down this path of exotica music because you put out a lot of really cool music. Honestly. Thank you, man. Thank you. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh one of my bigger successes in my life in terms of music, because we have actual fans. Yeah. You know, when you have people that you don't know that come up to you at Tiki Oasis and they're from some other part of the world or country and like I listen to your music, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, that's pretty damn cool. Less than 10 bands in the world playing this kind of music. So Probably. that's kind of kind of cool in, in and of itself is that it's kind of almost a dead genre, but a few people do it. So did you guys ever do any Martin Denny music? Uh, well, uh, like you. We did uh, Enchanted Sea, but that did that oh. with 5 -0. But we also did it with the orchestra early on. We've been playing okay. Enchanted Sea for a long time. Great um, song. Yeah. And, of course, we play Quiet Village, which I call the uh, Stairway to Heaven of Exotica. I've always um, said the exact same thing. <laughs> I swear to God. I've always it said is. the Stairway to Heaven of Exotica. Uh, and I make people stand up and, you know, stand up for the national anthem of Tiki, you know. And so <laughs> that we play that one, and I don't think we played... Those are the only two Martin Denny's. There's a couple songs I'd like to play, but we've, we've not we've not done them. Yeah. But. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time with us. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, man. And uh, yeah, hopefully right I'll on. see you in a tiki bar soon. Uh, I hope so, man. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> thank you, man. Stay safe. Yeah. And thank you for this. Cool. You know, I'd like to share something with you guys. Uh, the Hula Girls recorded recently our own version of a Martin Denny song, a song called The Enchanted Sea. And in fact is actually going to be released on High Tide Recordings. And with us right now, we have Vincent and Magdalena from High Tide Recordings. Come on in, guys. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having us. How are you guys doing? 
Doing great. Having a jungle bird over here. Very nice. So your record label uh, seemed to come out of nowhere. How long have you guys been uh, putting out records? We've been releasing records since about 2016. Oh, really? And yeah, it was unintentional. We didn't really mean to start a label, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we, we had shopped my band's record all around. It's actually the theme song for uh, Spike's Breezeway Cocktail that, Hour. That was the song? Um, you know, the, the Neon Boneyard is that song, and it's actually the B-side of the what turned out to be the first High Tide record. Yeah. Um, I used that song. We had shopped that around to a bunch of labels, and we got the same answer from everybody. Uh, sounds great, but we're not really doing vinyl right now. Oh. So we just. Some of them weren't even just. They weren't interested in even adding new bands to the roster, yeah. which was interesting. So. So uh, we conceived High Tide Recordings. We stamped it on the record, and here we are, four years later, uh, fifty-seven releases later. So. Holy smokes! Pretty wild. So with a name like High Tide Recordings, what kind of music do you guys normally produce? Um, the bands that we started with initially were largely instrumental surf. Um, we've since added Exotica to the label. We One of our first bands actually early on was a Hawaiian swing vibe, Slowly in the Boats from Philadelphia. Um, we've even got some vocal music that's making its way into the mix. The Hula Girls. The, the Hula Girls. <laughs> the High Risers, yeah. Televisionaries, who you yeah. know. So it's actually um, like... All great a bands. lot more vocal than we ever really intended, I would say. But yeah, any anything that's kind of late fifties, early sixties. But you know, it's not it's not nostalgia. You know, these bands are current. Um, they're already original music, and you know, we we feel like you know, there's a lot of great music being made. Um, you know, that's sort of inspired by that era. So we want to bring those bands uh, to the forefront right now. Definitely. Uh, starting record label seems like a horrible idea these days. What what made you guys think that that was a business plan that would that would work? You know. Well, like we said, it was it was definitely not the plan. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think we tend to get involved with projects and start companies and uh, based on a need. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's our own need. Sometimes it's bands. Um, and I think that. A lot of this label was out of uh, hoping to create an opportunity for other bands that were looking for a home. And we wanted to try and get as much of the new music out there and hopefully kind of create this this new wave of, I mean, surf was how it started. But. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, again, looking back, like there, it's hard to get people to... Um, be open to new new bands in this genre you know a lot of people think that you know dick dale is where great surf music ended or then there's people that think you know the 90s wave was sort of the last of the great surf music but um you know we wanted to provide an outlet for the bands that are doing it now so um you know when we put that black flamingos out record out um and you know we got the response from it you know a lot of people um you know encouraged us to, to keep going so here we are I was going to say, uh, Vincent, your band, The Black Flamingos, uh, does have, a. it seems like a bit of an exotica kind of feel to it without maybe the bird sounds or the, the, the sound effects or whatever. Um, was, there, was there a deliberate kind of uh, leaning towards that direction or uh, what, what influenced your sound? Well, I will say that, uh, you know, as you know, Exotica was rooted very much in, in my ass, right? Um, and, uh, you know, my, my two guys, Declan and Rob, are both jazz trained musicians. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when they, you know, bring an idea to the table that might be a little sort of slower or darker, uh, you know, the tendency is to sort of layer some of that exotic percussion over it or, you know, the vibraphones over it. Uh, you sort of get this... Um, you know, sort of exotic kind of sound. One good example of that is Kali Ma from our newest record. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think it's the jazz roots that um, you know my two my two guys have that sort of start to start to have Black Flamingos explore uh, that exotica sound. I tell you, it's a good band. Like it's, it's thank you one of my favorites and 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 one of my favorites enough to have it featured in Spike's Breezeway Cocktail Hour every single week. I've heard your song 
so many times for every time <laughs> I edit one of those videos. But I know it's, it's a constant. It's just yeah. the background. Yeah. All you gotta do is just add a little clave and you know, it's exotic. Traditionally, musicians sort of think in terms of albums, right? Yeah. So it's like when you're when you're writing or when you're recording, it's like, all right, when we have 11, 12, 13 songs, we'll go into the studio and, you know, we'll make a Black Flamingos record. But we've actually talked about doing um, smaller, like, EPs that are based on themes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ex exotic, you know, sort of the more exotic side of Black Flamingos is, is one thing we've we've thought about thought about doing some like spaghetti western style stuff and really exploring that right. um you know some of the some of the hot rod stuff that you hear on play speedway like the real upbeat you know kind of dick dale style stuff so i think that's what you might see you know uh, over the next few years is maybe smaller themed uh eps from black flamingos yeah. and uh in which case you know you, you might see us go exotic we'll see what happens okay uh I think for a record see oh sorry Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think you'll see a little more of that side coming from the High Tide Orchestra. Um, oh. That is definitely a direction that we've gotten pretty excited about over the last couple of months, collaborating with a bunch of different artists that are in High Tide bands. Um, some of them are friends of the label, and there have definitely been some very exotic directions that that has gone in and will continue to go in, I would say. So... Stay tuned. Stay tuned for more. Yeah. You also produce the High Tide Summer Holiday and the High Tide Winter Holiday, two music festivals in New Jersey and Pittsburgh, correct? That's correct. That's correct, and, yeah. And um, how would you say that the scene is different out there than it is in Southern California? I mean, it's, I'll be honest, there, it, it's a different feeling than SoCal because SoCal is where it started, you know? So, when you get far away from the mothership, you know, it feels a little bit more like you have to maybe create, you know, the feeling uh, of that sort of escapism um, that we try and, and create with all of our events. And we, we recognize that it's, you know, a huge inspiration is, you know, uh, the, the SoCal, you know, kind of tiki uh, uh, origins. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's not there's not 60 year old tiki bars on the East Coast. It's just not a thing. So we recognize that, but, um, you know, we want to, to create an event that's, you know, commutable for people that maybe can't get on a plane and fly to Tiki Oasis, or maybe they, maybe they do that, but you know, that's not enough and they want to do something closer to home. So, um, we're inspired by those SoCal events. Uh, you know, we recognize that, uh, you know, that's where this all started, but, um, you know, we kind of wanted to add a little bit of like an, an East coast spin on, uh, what's been, what's been happening down there. Do you uh, do you have a music video or a video that we can share from either your band or one of the bands on the labels? Well, yes, we have the the infamous Surfer Jets Toxic video, which is it's true. It's which true. which it's wasn't true. it wasn't really it wasn't really intended to be a music video, honestly. Like that started out as just like, all right, you know, like how many just how many times you just set a camera up and like throw it on Facebook or Instagram? Yeah, but. Here we are, five million views later on that one. So, What is it about Go Go and Cha Cha and Surf and uh, Lounge and Exotica that is so moving to you guys? 
I think for us, it really comes down to this feeling of being transported somewhere else. Um, you're creating this soundscape that is uh, shaping an experience for people when they're having a cocktail or dinner. Um, so for us, it's fun to every gig be doing something different, theming it out by hour, um, doing all Japanese sets from all the vinyl that we got when we were in Japan. Um, you know, it's, it's this, it's this interesting way to experience music that people, especially at some of the more modern places that we DJ have not ever heard before. So there's this like feeling of, Oh man, like, what is this? It's just, it makes me feel like I'm somewhere else. Uh, well, you know, thank you guys so much for thinking of us and having us. Um, you know, we're, we're really, um, you know, excited to have, uh, you know, created some art that, uh, you know, people in the surf and, and tiki and even rockabilly scenes are, are seeming to appreciate. Um, we have a lot of great releases coming up. Um, you know, the Hula Girls record is out now. Um, after a little bit of a delay due to uh, pressing plant closure, we'll do that now. Um, the new Surfer Jets is also out now. Uh, or it's out officially in two weeks, but we're already yeah. shipping it. Um, lots of great stuff coming up. Uh, the Mana is later this month. Aqualads later this year. Um, Los Freneticos. And we have some really great stuff up our sleeves for holiday. Um, you know, as well as some cool merch stuff coming up. So just, you know, keep an eye on the Instagram and the website. Um, also, I'll just say to you, like, you know, hop on the email list if you can, because, you know, we're trying to not make Facebook our only, or, or even just social media our only point of contact, because, you know, those platforms change. So keep in touch via email uh, if you can, or better yet, you know, come out to a show or pick up a record and keep in touch that way. So thanks for having us. Thank you. I hope you guys are having a great Sunday. How about the Lowbrow Luau? That, I think that's going to be a really cool event. I think the Hula Girls open, uh, what, the first night of the event. And we got a lot of cool stuff uh, in store. But um, don't go anywhere yet because there are so many other great guests that are, that are coming down uh, today during this, uh, this show. And I hope you guys are digging it. This is just volume one. Volume one? Uh, episode one? You know, you know what I mean. So... I think we're gonna do it again. And if you guys are digging it, please be sure to uh, to tip some of the performers by visiting the link there. I mean, they'll be tipping all the performers. Maybe Shag won't get a tip because I think he's doing probably just fine. But there's a lot of musicians that are really hurt. And uh, and a lot of the, uh, the, the tips will go to helping them, them out. So I hope you guys are having a great Sunday and uh, let's get back to the interviews and stuff. Our next guest is considered one of the greatest <laughs> Southern California mid-century slash tiki artists in the scene uh, in existence. I guess really it's a weird thing because I know him as a buddy and now I'm going to be a fan. So um, uh, Josh Shag Eagle, <laughs> why don't you uh, come on down? Hey, hey. Good that to be here. <laughs> uh, Shag and I have been buddies for a little bit, and I don't think I've ever been a, a fan to him in person, but this is, uh, maybe this will be the first time that I can speak to you freely as just a fan and uh, say that your artistic and musical impact in the tiki world is, um, I think, unmatched. Yeah, well, thank you. I don't know if I have very much musical impact in the tiki world, but uh, the music was kind of a launching pad for the art. Yeah. Well, I think um, if you didn't impact a bunch of musicians uh, directly, you at least impacted me because uh, my old babysitter, um, <laughs> Steve, Steve Jacobs, was the bass player in your band, The Tiki Tones. 
And um, I think that subliminally led me down this tiki world into uh, starting my own tiki band. So uh, you did, I think you did indirectly influence at least the hula girls in that way. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I found out who you were, you know, I was like really surprised that you were into this kind of stuff because you're like a whole generation behind me, you know? Yeah. So how would you say that, that Tiki and Exotica influences uh, your own artwork? And, and maybe where did, you, where did you discover Tiki and how did you end up becoming known kind of as, and I don't know if you like this or not, but a Tiki artist, really? Well, I, I got into Tiki in the early 80s, actually. Yeah. Uh, when me and Steve Jacobs, your old babysitter, uh, and a girl named Becky Abenkamp, uh, we all kind of started going out to bars. We had just turned 21. We liked going to the, we called them old man bars, which were bars that were untouched since the 50s or 60s. And that. sometimes they were theme bars. Yeah. And our favorite were the tiki bars because you paid an extra five bucks and you got to keep the ceramic mug. Right. And that was kind of like our intro into collecting tiki. You know, five bucks, you have a cool little souvenir for the evening. Right. And then we started noticing you could find them in thrift stores and at the flea market. So we started buying them up there. And then when you're collecting something and your friends are collecting the same thing, it kind of becomes this arms race where you want to have a better collection than them. Totally. So that's kind of how I got really into collecting tiki and into going to bars, discovering which bars were still around. And um, the, the band I had been in with Steve before the Tiki Tones, the Swamp Zombies, had a little bit of a, a, a tiki aesthetic as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of that came from old record covers, you know? Okay. You go to the store, you're looking for a tiki mug or something, you look through the record bin, you pull out this this record with an awesome record cover, you take it home, you know, you paid 25 cents for it, you put it on, and a lot of times it was kind of not that good, but the, but the album cover was great. Yeah. And so the music I was playing, I wanted to kind of encapsulate the feeling of what that album cover told me, not necessarily what the actual record sounded like. And uh, what, what would you say was the moment that really um, made you go from being a commercial artist to a fine artist? And, and who, what, um, was, there, was there a defining moment when that happened? There was no defining moment, but I can tell you the, the very first moment that I went from a commercial artist to a, a fine artist was when Otto von Stroheim, who... Uh, he published a fanzine called Tiki News back in the 90s, and he's also the, the, the promoter of Tiki Oasis, the world's largest tiki gathering. He called me up one day and said he had booked me an art show. And so I had to make some paintings. And I, up until that time, I, I had not considered myself a fine artist. Okay. I thought I was a commercial artist. So I, was, I thought, oh, Shoot, I, I, I got to make some more. actual paintings that hang on a wall that people are maybe going to want to look at and buy. Testing. But I didn't think anyone would buy these paintings, so I thought, what kind of painting do I want on my own wall? Because I'm, I'm going to end up with these paintings anyway. And those were the first five shag paintings. So, so I guess going towards to your... Um, so going to the original theme of the band, I know that, that Steve had a big, upright, a big purple upright base that you had painted a big tiki on. Um, you guys dabbled in um, lounge music a little bit, but it was mostly s instrumental surf, would, would you say? Yeah, it was, you know, the Fender Reverb Tank, uh, yeah. you know, echoey surf music, basically, with tiki chants in the back and the occasional foray into Exotica. Plus, we had our Hammond B3 organ. Mm -hmm.
can't, I can't even tell you how much that impacted the Hula Girls, your guys' band and the Blue Hawaiians. Really. Uh, the Blue Hawaiians, yeah. They're, they were great. I know, and I got Gary Brandon uh, from the Blue Hawaiians in my band. If you ever want to join the Hula Girls... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I actually swore off playing altogether last summer. One of my bands reunited and played a festival in Italy, and after that I said I was finished with music completely. Was it the, the Huntington Cads? Yeah, the Huntington Cads. Oh, okay. Did you play with them or? Yeah, yeah. Did you enjoy it? I loved practicing with them. I loved traveling with them. I loved hanging with them. I didn't like being on stage at all and playing. I was totally over it. I would imagine that it's a different experience for you on stage now because being a, a well-known artist, uh, people probably look at you differently on stage. Is that, is that something that you felt? A little bit. It was also weird backstage when like the headliners were coming up to me and asking for autographs and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of cool too. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Did, Exo did Exotica ever show up in the Tiki Tones concept at all? A little bit. You know, yeah. we did a couple sort of semi-Exotica covers. Okay. Um, obviously we didn't have the vibes and we were a little too loud to play real straight Exotica. Uh, I think the Exotica came more in kind of the presentation and the record covers and things. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, do you have a favorite Exotica song by, uh, let's say by Martin Denny, since we're we're talking about Martin Denny today? Hmm. I don't. I don't know if I have a specifically a, a favorite song. I have yeah. I have Exotica artists I like. Yeah. Um, for example, I think um, Robert Drasnin is better than any. Martin Denny or Arthur, Arthur Lyman or Les Baxter uh, and, album. And why do you say that? Uh, I think the songs are more fully realized and the recording is really good. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I saw Robert. Did I see Robert Drasnin at Don the Beachcomber? Did he, he did a thing there, right? That wouldn't surprise me. He played quite a bit in the last yeah, couple I, decades. I think I saw him with the, with the YT Key maybe. Was that the band? It's possible. Yeah, and I think it was um, uh, Alika Lyman, Arthur Lyman's son or grandson, was playing percussion for that thing. When Drasnin first reunited in the 90s, uh, DJ Bonebreak was playing percussion for him. No for way. X. No way. Yeah. So well, what were some of those tiki bars that you said you were going to with uh, Steve back in the, the 80s and 90s? Um, the Hookah, mm -hmm. Telbos. Wow. Uh, Tiki T, obviously, still there. Uh, the Tonga Hut, even. We went by the Tonga Hut in the 90s, uh -huh. and it was kind of a working-class bar. You know, they had, like, Bud Light banners hanging from the ceiling, and they were playing George Thorogood on the on the jukebox. <laughs> That's so funny. But we asked, we asked the bartender if he could make tropical drinks. He was, like, 90 years old. Oh. And I think he was, you know, the original bartender. So he... Uh, He's like, yeah, so I ordered a zombie and it took him like half an hour to make the zombie. <laughs> Little old man hunched over the, the back of the bar with trembling hands mixing these ingredients. Uh-huh. It's like a 14 ingredient cocktail too. Yeah. Like <laughs> but it was weird. It was a trip. And then when the, when the Tonga Hut came back, you know, 25 years later, I was so, so, so glad to see that it had returned to sort of its tiki glory. Yeah, I know. They did such a great job with that place. What was your introduction to Exotica? Well, this goes back to the 80s again. Yeah. And, uh, you know, digging through thrift stores, found a record, most awesome record cover I'd ever seen in my life. And that was Les Baxter's Ritual of the Savage. Oh, that's the best one. That, I mean, I saw that album cover and I was like, I don't know what this is. I have to have this. Yeah. And I remember I brought it home, put it on my turntable and listened to it. And I was like, uh, this is kind of weak, you know, <laughs> like the cover is so like, you know, natives are going to spear you. And, and I mean, it's just so over the top. Totally. And then the music was this sort of sleepy time, slightly exotic jazz. Yeah. And I remember kind of being disappointed that the, the music didn't match the album cover. But then a, a few years later, when I got my, I got Martin Denny, Exotica and put that on. I was like, wait, this sounds 
this sounds just like that Les Baxter album. And I pulled them both out and I'm like, these are the same songs, but <laughs> these songs sound a lot better, you know? Oh, right. Yeah. Well, what's Martin that? Denny had, you know, he kind of pepped them up and he'd added all the bird sounds and things. And, and suddenly I had an appreciation for Exotica. I love Exotica. I love what it does to transport you. And I, and I think that's kind of the same thing that, that a lot of your, that a lot of your paintings do is they transport you. Yeah. You know, I, people, people want escapism. Yep. They want, I mean, that was the beauty of the Tiki bar back in the fifties or sixties. You know, you get off work, step inside, suddenly you're in the South Pacific, you get a little tipsy. There's a, a, a beautiful waitress in a hula skirt giving you a big giant scorpion bowl and, and you could forget about your life. You know, you could tr be transported somewhere else. And that's, that's what I've tried to do with my art as well. And how, how have you seen the Tiki scene change? I know there really wasn't a, a scene when you guys first got into it, but how have you seen the Tiki scene change uh, to this point now? I mean, it must be, it must be, um, it must be really interesting for you to see it going from nobody knowing anything about it to where we are now. Yeah. And it's gone through phases and, you know, every, since the nineties, I, I always thought this is it for Tiki. You know, people are going to lose interest, but it's just grown and grown and grown. And now with the resurgence of craft cocktails and a whole sort of gourmet cocktail culture or, or whatever you want to call it, you know, that's brought a whole new group of people into it. And, and they're, they're more into the drinks than the decor. I know that's, that's the one thing that gets me because I remember when I was first getting back into it, it was well before the craft cocktail uh, craze had, had started. And we would go to Sam Seafood and we were just excited that we were getting a big blue drink and a big fishbowl. And yeah. the drinks were horrible. But, <laughs> but you were stoked that you were drinking it around all this really cool decor. Yeah. Before you knew better, any tropical drink was delicious, you know? <laughs> That's right. But but you're right. It's flip-flop. Now it's it's the drinks are the most important and decor is, is secondary to a lot of people. And um, I kind of don't. I kind of don't understand that. It's always been about escapism to me and the quality of, of food and cocktails. Second. Yeah, I hope that, I hope that the young people who are into it for the cocktails eventually latch on to the decor as well. Mm -hmm. Because as, as Sven said, you know, we have to get the young people into the decor. They like the cocktails. They don't like the decor. I know. He's been the biggest advocate for like really paying attention to what, makes tiki tiki but tiki is about maximalism absolutely look at look at the breezeway by the way you still haven't been in the breezeway oh, no. <laughs> um is disney would you say that disney's the biggest client you you've had or uh have there been other big ones in that same arena uh disney's yeah disney's probably the biggest although it's just a small portion of what i do yeah um i mean the biggest client is the shag store but oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> outside of that yeah disney's big i'm doing i'm i have a bunch of star wars stuff coming out this summer oh wow okay which will probably be pretty big growing up in southern california did you ever imagine that your stuff would show up in disneyland or that you'd have a hand in designing stuff for disneyland no no i you know it's all taken me by surprise and and i still kind of i i have to pinch myself sometimes Bye. Thank you, Chag, so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. And uh, and I do sincerely appreciate uh, you indirectly dragging me into this scene. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. I'll see you soon. All right. Ciao. I'd like to introduce one of my other friends, Mr. Otto von Stroheim, the creator of Tiki Oasis, the biggest, uh, longest running Tiki festival in the history of Tiki festivals. Otto, welcome. Uh, thank you, Spike. Good to see you. <laughs> Who are some of the first bands that you had at, uh, at Tiki Oasis? Well, the funny thing about starting Tiki Oasis in 2001 is that there just wasn't a lot of Exotica bands around. There, there weren't any. There was nobody. Like, if I said, hey, I want to get a band, I didn't have a choice. I mean, in, in the 90s, yeah, it was tough. In the 90s, there was Don Tiki in Hawaii, and they were uh, professional musicians, you know, so they would cost a lot of money to bring over. There was the Blue Hawaiians in Los Angeles, uh, but again, they were professional musicians. And by the time Tiki Oasis rolled around in 2000, they were at their peak, you know? Yeah. They were pretty big and they'd be pretty pricey and, and probably too big to play at that small hotel. Um, Things insane. 
Right. Yeah. They just got signed to Capitol and had put out one of their uh, epic, you know, best releases. And they, they had uh, some really nice artwork and uh, Brad Benedict produced the record and stuff. The guy who did the Ultra Lounge series, you know. So, yeah, they were, they were at the peak of their career right then. So I couldn't get them. So the first TQ Oasis um, was too small to have any bands. You know, it was too impromptu. It was just a, a little backyard party, you know. It was just a gathering of friends, you know. Immediate. But the second one, we started thinking about having bands and we had DJs. Uh, and then the the third one, we really ramped up and, and we had bands. They were still on the lawn. We didn't have a stage. We didn't have a sound man. It was basically on the lawn with your amps and your microphones and a PA. Like that was, uh, Ape was there that year, right? Yeah. So then at that point, I, I got Ape. I got Lushy from Seattle. Yep. Um, Project Pimento from San Francisco. Uh, uh, the Mike High Gents had formed. They had a different name. They had a Hawaiian name then, but... Uh, we got them from L.A. Uh, uh, Judd was friends with King Kukulele. And, of course, we had King Kukulele. We've had King Kukulele every year, even the first year. Uh, so he performed live. So I guess that's a band, I guess, uh, the, the first year. Um, yeah, so, you know, in the 90s, I mean, there was a band called KVZ in Germany doing Exotica stuff. But there was literally no Exotica bands in the 90s that, that I knew of. Yeah. I mean, some of the performers were still playing. You know, Martin Denny would play occasionally in the 90s. And Arthur Lyman had a a weekly solo gig in the nineties, you know, uh -huh. until he got sick, you know, so it, it was a weird time for Exotica music. You know, it wasn't until about 2000, about the time that TQ Oasis started, that bands started popping up, you know, like uh, Clouseau in Houston, uh, who we later had at TQ Oasis, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the Smoking Men Hoonies, you know, the Smoking Men Hoonies <laughs> were still kind of forming, you know, and getting their feet and getting their sea legs and, and writing songs, right? Yeah, we were rough back then. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I mean, you didn't have like a uh, a focus, and, and you didn't have a lot of gigs, probably, right? I mean, there right. probably weren't a lot of people booking here. Well, it was all it was also brand new to all of us. You know what I mean? It, um, I know that you had found Tiki well before a lot of us, but um, for most most people, uh, it was the book of Tiki from Sven that really kind of opened the, the door to everybody. Yeah, and the interesting thing about the Book of Tiki is uh, it had a limit as to, you know, how thick it could be based on the price right. and, and the price point. So Sven had to cut out the music section and the film section. And people don't know that. Like, hardcore Tiki fans go, well, you, mean, you hardly even mentioned Martin Denny. And, oh, you didn't even mention this movie, you know, the Con Tiki, Thor Heyerdahl, or, you know, all these great movies that were filmed all over Polynesia. Wow. And he's like, yeah, I know. I had to cut that section out. So he got that all in Tiki Pop. All the movie stuff is like really heavily in there, you know, and and, um, and the music he, he put out the the CD, the sound of Tiki. Yep. Uh, but that had originally been written and and was supposed to be in the book of Tiki. So again, exotica music uh, didn't get uh, perpetuated. Tiki music didn't. Yep. And so, like on the Ultra Lounge compilations, there's you know Bongo Land and there's uh, there's one Exotica CD and a lot of Martin Denny was reissued at that time. But not a lot of the other artists were. Right. You know, you, uh, a lot of them were left in obscurity. Guys like uh, Gene Rains or uh, one of my favorites is uh, John Spencer and the Kona Coasters. Uh, you know, they just never got reissued on CD yeah. because they didn't get included in any sort of movement. You know, in the lounge movement, um, it's clear who who was big. You know, Billy May and Frank Sinatra, you know, the, the people that had hits already, you know, and Capitol had tons of their stuff. You know, a lot of their stuff got reissued, but... Uh, and Arthur Lyman did later on Ryko Disc, you know, kind of a budgety kind of thing, you know. But you know, Martin Denny was the only one that really got reissued heavily, and and, and Les Baxter, I guess. It's, yeah, he was on Capitol too. Right. I wonder, I wonder how the music scene would have been different had that section been included in the original Book of Tiki, the, the music thing, because I I was oblivious to that. I it was around the time Swingers was out, so I was I was starting to dabble yeah. in, in those swing bands and stuff, but. Yeah, that other yeah. stuff was just weird music that I didn't understand at the time. Right, yeah, there was no focus for it because uh, the education and the history of it hadn't been shared and, and, and the depth, you know, the knowledge. But yeah, Swing, that's a good example. You know, Swing was was released, you know, like 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 I said, Billy May and Frank Sinatra, their best stuff is, is their Swing right. stuff, you know. And, and Swing got really huge yep. because it was popularized you know and, and it had the dancing element obviously tiki music doesn't have a dancing element but it does have a you can dress up and listen to tiki music so it has a fashion element yeah. you know how how would you say that the the music has changed from the early days of tiki oasis to uh where we are now with tiki oasis 20 is it tiki oasis 20 
It will be in August. In yeah. August of 2020, it'll be Tiki Wasted 20. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, one great thing is that the event is so big that I can afford to uh, hire any band that I want. I, I can afford to bring out a band like Don Tiki, which we have done. Um, you know, I can give a headlining gig to a band like Ape and fly them down from San Francisco. You know, people that are professional musicians or people that have day jobs and they can't take time off, they need to get compensated. Um, you know, I don't have to just go with local bands from San Diego or Orange County or, or L.A. You know, I can get bands from around the country so I can get bands like Southern Culture on the Skids or Man or Astro Man or, you know, big names that would play a big venue. So, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of exotica bands have formed around. Um, I'm probably I'm going to miss lots of them, but let me just name off a few. There's there's a cool band called Five U, like a. Uh, like 5 O, but 5 U from St. Louis. Um, and then, you know, just kind of smattered around the country and around the world. Like, um, obviously, there's Tikiaki Orchestra from the L.A. area, which we've had at uh, Tiki Oasis several times. And then uh, earlier on, uh, Y Tiki, who are technically still around, but but haven't played for a few years. Uh, they're from, like, Boston and Hawaii. I mean, there's, uh, we mentioned Abe and the Maikai Gents and Clouseau from Houston and Lush from Seattle. And a band that kind of formed because they saw that that the audience was there and that Tiki Oasis was an opportunity, uh, Tiki Joe's Ocean from Seattle. And they've put out a couple of Christmas CDs and then a couple of other CDs, and they're great. You know, they have this really great uh, sort of Latin, but a little bit orchestrated, a little bit jazzy kind of sound, a, a lot like Tiki Aki Orchestra. Um, sure. And they've got four CDs out. I mean, like, Crazy. I think they might have even just released another one that's like digital only that, that, that they haven't had an opportunity to give a, an official release to. Uh, but then there's like, you know, Ixtokwele in Sweden or a band called uh, Left Arm of Buddha from Belgium. Wow. Um, you know, there's a lot of European bands. Um, Australia has a good scene. Mm -hmm. uh, who else? I don't know. Can you name any other like new exotica bands in the last 10 years? No, I mean, uh, Ex was the one that was impressed me the most. We played with them at, at the Mai Kai and, uh, they're just, inc they're just downright incredible. Yeah. They have that Martin Denny sound down yep. and in, in a very authentic way because they're excellent, excellent jazz musicians, right? They all read music. And, and so like Martin Denny's band, you know, Martin Denny was a, a band leader of, of jazz bands and, and, uh, you know, pop bands of the time of the forties, you know, so that it's basically jazz and big band stuff, uh, you know, very professional musician. He wasn't just like, you know, Don Ho, a guy banging on the piano, you know, and <laughs> banging out some kind of, you know, rock tunes or something. And Denny was like a band leader. You know? Right. Well, um, let me ask you, what was your attraction to Tiki? Well, I was born and raised in Southern California. So I, I kind of, you know, I grew up with surf, uh, culture, um, Maybe not so much surf music, but I got into that, you know, heavily like in high school. Um, and dry, I, I grew up in Torrance. I was a little kid in Torrance, and then I moved to the San Fernando Valley. So both of those places were big, big hotbeds of tiki restaurants. And so just driving around, you know, just going to church or something on a Sunday, I would see these tiki restaurants. I think it's uh, I think it's funny how certain people arrive at certain things. Uh, Bob and Leroy, I think it was Bob from Oceanic Arts, told me that the the way that they got inspired to do what they did is that he would walk past Clifton specific seas in downtown LA. And that's what made him go, Oh, I want to start a theming business or theming yeah. core business. So we all come to it from, from different places, but it's all from around Southern California. It seems like. Right. And like bamboo bands, grandfather, Eli Headley, you know, was in the movie industry as was right. Donna Beachcomber a little bit, you know, and, and, uh -huh. So th that was their business and where they made the money and then they could live their lifestyle based on that, you know. Right. Let me uh, let me ask you, what is the future of Tiki Oasis? I know we've moved locations, still in San Diego, but to a different hotel. Uh, well, the new hotel that we're at uh, has, has long been a desired location for us. And so where we're at is Paradise Point, which used to be called Vacation Village. Um, yeah. They also do, I mean, they're sold out of time. They're, they're a resort. Um, but it's just going to be incredible for our guests. And, and I'm just sad that uh, the guests can really experience it in full this year. And they have to wait until next year to like really get the big Tiki Oasis on an island experience. But uh, whatever happens this year, we're going to go. Some people are going to go. Something's going to happen. 
and we're going to be on an island together. So we're going to be like Gilligan's Island, you know, we're going to be like <laughs> walking around barefoot and uh, renting bicycles to get from one side of the island to the other or, or a scooter or something, or maybe a paddle board to get around to the other side of the island, depending on where your room is, you know, uh-huh. uh, it's going to be crazy. Uh, you can't, when you're on one half of the property, you can't tell what's going on on the other half. Like, wow. That's you incredible. cannot see, you You will be lost, like you're shipwrecked there. <laughs> sure. You know, the, the room parties are going to be a lot different. You know, the band is not going to be on the grass next to the pool and viewable from your hotel room. Yeah. The Paradise Point is all one level. There's no uh, elevators to get stuck in. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's, that's crazy. crazy. <laughs> yeah, there's no... Uh, eight floors of stairs to climb. If you want to climb stairs, like if you need exercise, they do have a tower that's about eight stories tall or maybe six stories tall or something. You can climb up that. But otherwise, it's all on one level. I don't want to do it on the same level. (laughs) It's awesome. You just walk around. There's five swimming pools. So if you don't like the vibe of your swimming pool, just walk over to the other one, you know. I think that's really exciting. I, 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 if, if it happens, then I will certainly be there. Okay, we'll see you there in August. Cool. Well, hey, Otto, thank thank you so much uh, for sincerely for all you've done for Tiki and and the events that you put on and everything. You've really uh, you've really made a lot of people happy over the years. You and Dan. thank you, you too, and thank you for for having you know the Hula Girls and bringing them to Tiki Oasis and entertaining people and and keeping a lively spirit. You know, doing your photography. I, mean, I love what you do, and uh, I really appreciate it too. Well, thank you so much. Cheers. All right. Aloha. We couldn't do an episode on the roots of tiki music without doing a tribute to this man. Denny was universally known as the founder and reigning king of exotica music. Exotica or lounge music is a type of big band music with Latin rhythms and overtones of Pacific Ocean culture that was extremely popular back in the 50s and 60s. Its resurgence and new popularity today by members of the Tiki community show that Denny's roots ran deep. City and raised in Los Angeles, studied classical piano, and in the 1930s he toured South America for four and a half years. He was in Lima, Peru in 1932 when a revolution broke out. He was just 21. The band ended up in Rio de Janeiro, still playing the popular American music of the times, but sparking Denny's fascination with Latin rhythm. All his life, Denny collected a large number of ethnic instruments from all over the world which he used to spice up his stage performances. He created a hypnotic international sound that blended exotic elements, from bird calls to croaking frogs, jazz rhythms and gongs. He once described it as a fusion of Asian, South Pacific, American jazz, Latin American, and classical styles. Denny was a songwriter, author, and pianist, and served in the US Army Air Force in World War II, but he was best known as the father of exotica. 
His long career saw him performing well into the 1980s. He toured the world popularizing his brand of lounge music, which included exotic percussion, imaginative rearrangements of popular songs, and original songs that celebrated the tiki culture. In 1953, then he got a wire from Don Beach in Hawaii offering him a six-month contract if he'd be interested in playing the dagger bar at his place in Waikiki, Don the Beachcomber. In January 1954, Denny went to Honolulu. He stayed to form his own combo in 1955, performing under contract at the Hawaiian Village on Oahu and soon signing to Liberty Records. During his engagement at Hawaiian Village, Denny discovered what would become his trademark and the birth of Exotica. As the group played at night, Denny became aware of bullfrogs blending with the music. He thought it was a coincidence, but it happened every time. His bandmates began doing all sorts of tropical bird calls as a gag. At rehearsal, he had the band do Quiet Village with each doing a bird call spaced apart. Denny did the frog part, and the whole thing was incorporated into the arrangements of Quiet Village. It sold more than one million copies. The gimmick stuck, and soon Denny and his band began to pepper their performances with animal calls and ever stranger musical instruments like conch shells, Indonesian and Burmese gongs, Japanese kotos, and boo bands. His first album, Exotica, stayed at number one for five weeks in 1959. The release of Exotica proved perfectly timed. As the 50s drew to a close, Tiki culture was all the rage in mainland America, with Hawaiian shirts a fashion trend and tiki torches lit at all backyard parties. The album jacket was an influential factor guiding the fantasy of Denny's music. His first dozen albums always featured model Sandy Warner on the cover. Art designers always changed her looks to fit the mood of the package. The Exotica album was recorded in 1956 and released in 57. Denny would often have as many as three or four albums on the charts simultaneously. He had national hits with A Taste of Honey, The Enchanted Sea, and Ebb Tide. Martin Denny's final concert was held in Hawaii in February 2005 at a benefit to aid the tsunami victims. Then just three weeks later, on March 3, Martin Denny, the icon and innovator, passed away at the age of 93. His ashes were scattered at sea. I hope you guys enjoyed that little uh, uh, history, I guess you would say, of Martin Denny. So I, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I am uh, I'm certainly having a good time. I've been drinking this this rum barrel for most of the, well, I've had, I don't know, five or six of these things now. So folks, please uh, donate if you can. I don't want this to be like a PBS thing where you're like, it's, it's donors like you that make these things possible. But I also do know that, especially my band, uh, a lot of my guys are professional musicians, and so their like their jobs have been canceled. I do want to help uh, my band and the other bands that were featured in this episode, and hopefully we can uh, help them through this really tough time. So, please, a buddy of mine for almost 20 years, uh, Mr. Bamboo Ben. Ben, how you doing? Good yourselves. I'm uh, I'm doing all right. I am broadcasting live from within the breezeway of which you designed a lot of this. Well, we did the original canvas and then you took over and went mad. <laughs> yeah, but I'm looking up at the, the right? ceiling. Uh, you did all the ceiling, you did the, the waterfall thing here. So we did it for two days or three days. We were trying to film a TV show or do a- yeah, That's right. Like a uh, sizzle reel for a TV show. Yeah, and yeah. Quick build, yeah. Came out good though. Um, I wanted to talk real quick about some of the stuff that you are working on. Uh, you're obviously in a tiki bar right now. I'm Where building, are you? I'm working on Tiki Toms in Walnut Creek right now. We're completely redoing the inside, making it like over the top, bitch and tiki. Um, and uh, and how big is the place? Uh, how big is this place, you guys? Two thousand square feet. Two thousand square feet. Full wow. kit, full bit. It's gonna be really good. Is there, is there going they just had Justin. Okay. Come up, Justin Oliver, come up and, and do go over some drinks with them. Okay, uh, they're really stepping it up. These are all obviously work cards. Yeah, Here's, let me go over here real quick to 
to this area over here. This is a, the entryway. This is a hut. And there's like lava and stuff. And see up there, the entry for a hut. There's a hostess right there. It's kind of cool. And then there's a Darren right there. He's the owner. Wave, Darren. There he is. See up there? Yeah. There's a back here that's really cool. Uh, this is going to be a rent fighting. He's got warrants or something. Uh, this is kind of the shift thing we're doing back here. This is like, and then there's a cool, uh, cool little girl in the back. But Google Highway. Yeah. And then we got all sorts of really cool place. Yeah. Wow. That's, that looks great. I can't wait to visit it. Yeah. Lots of layers. Yep. Everyone's going to be different. Of course. There you go. But the big <laughs> <laughs> cool yeah. I wanted to ask you about some of the builds you worked on Sam Seafood and uh, Don the Beachcomber in particularly uh, you you worked on both of those right I mean it's the same building but after the original owner of Sam Seafood sold it to those guys that own Tsunami Sushi yeah. and his cluster of people I went in and helped um, do whatever I could because they had a designer there that was just like ripping balls down and cutting a rope off and doing all this crazy shit oh then Art Snyder came in, um, took over Don, or, or t I took over Kona, and had to clear up a bunch of mess behind it. And then, um, but I tried to salvage the best we could, and we added more from uh, stuff from Taboo Co. From Bay. his restaurant was right across the, the hallway from Taboo Co. So Art was able to get all this, a lot of stuff from there. Um, so then we put together a bit at Don's with whatever budget they had, and. Uh, uh, the the producer of this series actually was the um, I guess musical director for some time at Don the Beachcomber, so yeah. it's all kind of like yep. full full circle here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what what would you say is one of your favorite builds that you've done? Uh, the next one. Yeah, oh, the next just what it, whatever pays pays the most. Oh, it's not that. It's always yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can't have a favorite. It's like all yeah. of them are all of them are my favorites. Do, uh, does one feel more like home than others? I know that you spend a lot of time, like you, you, you usually sleep in these buildings yeah. while you're building them. Um, well, I used to when I was here. Now it's like a pain, you know, it's like getting old. It's like I more fun at the time. You also said that one was haunted, right? Oh, very haunted. Yeah. A lot of and the real Hawaiian also. Oh, yeah. That was, that was a mess, man. <laughs> <laughs> like doors closing and, and oh, yeah. stuff slamming open, doors wind blowing through the upstairs. Um, make it sound like a death was clicking around, but it was they, the plywood's all ground up, so no possible way, and there's liquid bulbs, and that's it. And it's like, ah. <laughs> what year did you start building tiki bars? And and explain kind of your uh, your heritage because you, you this is not just some uh, yeah. I come there's from, a lineage there. My grandfather was Eli Headley, and they called him the original beachcomber, and he was actually. Started the whole beachcombing scene uh, back in the day, um, being poor, scrounging stuff, and then um, in San Francisco, and he built a house out of driftwood. Um, so anyway, it goes back to that. He was part of Don Beach at one point. The only partnership he had with him was actually doing the decor. The one in McCadden, and then boom, I took over, and I heard that happen a lot with Don Beach. But um, but um. Yeah, so that's that's my dad, my grandfather. He he went from beach coming to the beach thing. Uh, that whole back whole story there. Um, had a tour at Disneyland for a while. Up for Walt Disney. Um, did the giant Arcrocus started. Um, old jobs. Yeah, people kind of forget that Tiki really wasn't widely known about before in two thousand. No, Disco killed it, man. Disco killed it, Tiki. Yeah. But even, but uh, but even like before, you could really even search for tiki on the internet. It was super underground. Yeah, super underground. Yeah, there were a handful of people cops that were like, you know, the core. Back yeah. There. So, so with your legacy and all your bars and all that, and uh, a million stories, will there ever be a book in in uh, in I, or uh, on the way? When I can't walk anymore, yeah. 
Put in my bag. I'm wrapping my bag. Gives out. Sure. <laughs> There'll be um, a book. One day. Nikki. Nikki. Can I? I know things got things got tricky with that, but can you explain um, kind of the process behind that one? Because you had to travel for that. And yeah, Nikki. Nikki. Um, Todd Rundgren and my wife Michelle, and uh, they live on Kauai, and um, they just wanted to build some cool bar. And we looked around different locations on Kauai. Finally, they came up this place in this burger joint in uh, Princeville that was up. So Michelle uh, and uh, we ended up doing like a tribute to the Cocoa Palms. And Cocoa Palms is basically coast. So we did these like big arches and did, we actually, I actually got, got in with the caretaker of Coco Palms and he was able to, to loan a couple of things that we, we, we put in there. And they actually bought, the run bought a big shell sink from, there was an auction once in a while, Coco Palms auctioned stuff off. And so yeah, it, cool. It was, it was hard. It's, it's North, North Shore, Kauai. It's really you're sweating the whole time. Yeah. Uh, the lifestyle is a really different story. People really do leave work. Surf. <laughs> uh -huh. are gone. You also work on, you worked on Maxis too, right? Maxis for sure. Yeah, and that, would, would you say that that's probably one of the, the top tiki bars uh, in the country as far as uh, authentic? Um, I would say besides the Mai Max, yeah. Yeah, he he. Mark studied the Mai Tai a lot. Um, studied, he basically our world. Unfortunately, I got him into tiki sort of. Um, <laughs> he, we we did tiki cat. All um, right. He, uh, we do a, a thing called the shrunken head in Grand Rapids in the warehouse where all the his, his like um he's his his, his his way back the hot hat and all. The, you know, Grand Rapids and Brewing Company, all these stuff. So, but he got into CP. I took, I took him like, whoa, just left. <laughs> uh, would you say that your, I, I hate to put words in your mouth, but I kind of, I kind of know the answer to this, but uh, your favorite tiki bar in the whole world is, is that the Mai Kai? Yeah, totally. Hands I, I, down, I, totally the same for me. And, and don't take offense to that because I, I love all the, a lot of, I love all the tiki bars yeah. that you built, especially uh, for Bin Island and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Mai Kai is just Mai Kai. It's it's uh, the best. That's what they, the best. they in, in Tahitian. It's Mai Kai means the best. It is the best. Yeah. What What would you say the average length of a job uh, designing and building a tiki bar is for you? Probably about two to four weeks. Okay. Yeah. Seems quick. Four. Yeah. We could do a camp in a couple of weeks and then. And then adding all the details is the part that, you know, that's another. Like right now, Tiki Toms, we're doing details. We canvas and then went home for a little bit. And now we're, we came back a week to do all the details. And they, they have a lot of uh, stuff coming here. And so do you recommend where they get the art? Or do you, like, do you expect them to have a collection first? Or? It kind of goes both ways, you know? Yeah. People that know have a collection. If they're not, then they and then, but we also help tell them where to buy different things, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. Yeah, I don't think people understand how expensive it is to build a tiki bar, and, and it's in the art, right? Yeah, it gets there. It gets there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool, man. Talk to you guys soon. All right. Thanks so much, Ben.
Well, Tiki Bar is just decor if you don't have drinks. And I'd like to bring on one of my good friends from Trader Sam's at the Disneyland Hotel, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Kelly Merrill. I see your, uh, your home and your quarantine uh, corner there. Yes, yes, it's Kelly's quarantine corner. Well, first of all, let me, let me just tell everybody that, that Kelly was one of the uh, original bartenders at Trader Sam's in Disneyland, right? Yeah, correct. I was there on the very first day. I made the very first drink. And did you really? I did. I made the very first drink the minute we opened our doors. It was the uh oh bowl. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. And how, uh, that was, and how long ago was uh, that? Nine years ago. It was nine years ago in May. So we opened in May of 2011. Okay. So next year is our 10 year anniversary. Hopefully, uh, Hopefully the world goes back to normal and we can have a full and crowded bar to celebrate our 10 years. It's uh, it's funny because I you know I've been doing that cocktail series on YouTube, uh, Spike's Breezeway Cocktail Hour, and I shaking one cocktail for me is like, all right, I've had enough of that. And I don't know how you do that all night every night. Like, it's man, it's a lot of work. Um, it is. Uh, it is a lot of work. You get used to it pretty quick. Um, I mean, that's how you see this. Adonis body before you now. Uh, is because of that. I, was gonna say. Mwah, mwah. Uh, <laughs> I know a lot of bars and I know a lot of your videos, which are great, by the way. A lot okay. of your videos, you use uh, your spindle blender, or your top down blender, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I use those a lot too, uh, not for this particular cocktail today. Uh, sadly, we do not use those at Trader Sam. So uh, we would love to bring those in. Uh, I think part of the shaking is not just because what you want to do with the drink and it's not just like for dilution, which is what you, that's what shaking is all about. It's for dilution, mm -hmm. but also to put on a show, you know, uh, yeah. you know, you don't have to like be crazy all into it. The, uh, they call it the, the Japanese five point star shake, uh, you know, but if you kind of get into it a little bit and make it look like you're, you have this like professional technique, the guests will recognize that, even if they don't know exactly what they're recognizing. And uh, and it does, it kind of enamors you and maybe they'll come back and see you again. Is it a weird, is it, so considering that and considering the performance about it and how that, I think that does entertain the guests and stuff. What do you think about the, the Mai Kai's uh, approach where all the cocktails are made in a cocktail um, kitchen and then served through a window? So there's no bartenders making drinks on the, on the floor. Yeah. Anymore. And as, as many people know, uh, you know, you, of course, and many of our friends that have, are uh, that kept up with their tiki history, that was the way they were all done yeah. at one point. And, um, you know, there would be a bartender up front making uh, martinis and, and Tom Collins, but all that the, the, the tiki drinks we made in the back. Um, I don't mind it. I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to visit the Mai Kai and their drinks are really good. So whatever they're doing, they might as well just keep doing it. But um, as a bartender, I, would, I wouldn't like that as much. I've worked um, plenty of places where you work in what's called a service bar. So you're just working at a service bar, meaning you're just making drinks for the servers. You're, there's no guest interactions. No one's directly tipping you. Uh, the nice thing about it is, is you don't have to worry about like keeping tabs and doing money and everything like that. You're literally just have, you have your face down. You're just making drinks over and over again. And we have that position at Trader Sam's also. It's just you know, kind of tucked away in the corner. <laughs> what um what is the most ordered drink at at Trader Sam's? Uh, I think the most ordered drink at Trader Sam's is probably the Krakatoa Punch. Uh, okay. If you ask five other Trader Sam's bartenders, you'll probably get five other answers. Could be yeah. the Shipwreck on the Rocks. Could be obviously the Mai Tai. It's a very friendly drink. It's a little on the sweet side, but that inherently makes it a little more palatable for many uh, non 
um, like hardcore tiki enthusiasts. And also it comes with a special effect show and you can also buy the mug. So it's got like the triple threat. I think that's a good one. I think yeah. personally they're all blowing it because my favorite cocktail at Trader Sam's is the tiki, 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 tiki rum. Yes, that I would say was very popular. Um, probably close to the top of the list a few years ago, but because it's essentially our version of a painkiller, it's almost exactly a painkiller. We just changed the construction of it a little bit. Uh, the painkiller has had a rise in popularity like nobody's business. The painkiller and a classic like three ingredient daiquiri. But the painkiller amongst young people and bartenders, young bartenders, painkillers are super popular. So therefore people don't come in and order the tiki rum, they just come in and order a painkiller. Well, actually I love the tiki, 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 tiki rum just because it's great at Trader Sam's or whatever, but I don't, yeah, I don't hardly make painkillers for myself anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good, but I think that Anything that has something that rich, for instance, the, the cream of coconut, you can only have so often so much. You kind of have to take a break from it. Totally agree. So are you going to make a cocktail for us uh, now? Yes. And what, and what would you like to, what, what are you making for us? Well, uh, today, since I was uh, very honored to be asked to hang out and talk to you guys, um, and because of my connection with Disney, and the fact that I've been drinking a lot of rum during quarantine, I just thought decided to switch gears a little bit. And I want to make a drink that has uh, scotch in it. I love making tiki drinks that have a base, a base spirit other than rum. We all love rum. Rum flows through my veins. But you got to kind of shake it up a little every once in a while. So this is going to be a drink um, called Walt's Nightcap. Walt Disney, a uh, huge tiki fan, helped influence the spread of you know, like tiki Polynesian pop, like the tiki and Polynesian pop around the Orange County area, just for the existence of Disney and tiki room and stuff being there. Uh, and also love scotch. He drank himself scotch with a little bit of a uh, twist of lemon in it and maybe a little bit of soda water. He had one of those all the time. So this is going to be a scotch uh, exotic beverage. And we're going to start with a little bit of lemon juice. And when I'm making a cocktail, you always like to start with non-alcoholic ingredients first. That way, if you kind of mess up or you change your mind or whatever, you can dump it out, but you're not dumping out alcohol. You're not, you're not wasting alcohol. So the lemon juice, we're going to do three quarters of an ounce. And we're also going to use a little bit of simple syrup. I use just one-to-one, -one, just regular white sugar, simple syrup, nothing... Uh, Nothing fancy. We're going to do a half of an ounce of simple syrup. All right, now we're going to use some passion fruit syrup. And this is passion fruit syrup that I made myself. Uh, basically, I bought passion fruit juice, like 100% not full concentrate passion fruit juice, and added sugar to it and just kind of let it warm up and stir it around. That's literally all I did. And it's like my favorite passion fruit, <laughs> my, my homemade passion fruit syrup. I love it. Wow. Well, we're going to do two teaspoons of that. Get out my measuring spoon. When you're pouring something that's a really small ingredient, or especially if you're pouring into a spoon or a teaspoon, I always like to remember to measure, to, to pour it away from over your drink. That way, if you oh. spill out a little bit more, you're not spilling into your drink. Uh, oh, that's interesting because we, yeah, we all know that, that, like, like, that go ahead. the smallest quantities are really impactful, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're making a drink that's only going to have a teaspoon of something in it, you probably did that on purpose. Like you don't want more than that in there. For instance, our next ingredient, and I usually have a little eyedropper, but um, I did not get it now. We're going to do um, just a few drops of absinthe or... If you read through uh, your grog log, uh, you read through all your Jeff Beach Bumberry recipe books, you'll see 10 billion drinks call for an eighth of an ounce of absinthe and a couple dashes of bitters. I know a lot of places mix those together. They'll mix like herb saint and bitters together. They just have it in one place to make it easy. But today we're just going to do an eighth of an ounce of, um, of Pernod. You can also use absinthe or herb saint. So this is what I'm talking about. I have to pour a couple drops out of here. Whoa, it spilled out a lot. But here's that my... stuff is really like that'll really change the flavor of a cocktail real quick. It's yes. like 
Yeah. Yes, which is why it calls for the amount of an eighth of a teaspoon. And I was lucky enough to actually find a little eighth of a teaspoon measuring measuring spoon. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna put in about six mint leaves. And for this cocktail, you don't have to be fancy and you don't have to smack them and, or kiss them or whatever you see like fancy bartenders do uh, because we're gonna be shaking it with the mint. The whole purpose of smacking your mint is to break up the, the film. There's like a waxy film on the mint leaves. So you wanna break up that waxy film and it makes it smell really good. So if you're just garnishing a drink, if you're just putting the mint just on top of the drink, that's when you wanna give it a smack. Gotcha. All right, okay. now we're going to do some gin. Um, I'm just using a really nice uh, St. George gin. St. George is one of my favorite gins. Um, they're up north in uh, Alameda, California, and they're freaking delicious. But any London dry gin in this recipe, it doesn't matter. You do half an ounce of that. All right, now we're using a uh, ginger liqueur. This is a very common ginger liqueur uh, called Canton. Pretty easy to find at the stores. There's other ones right there, but this is the one you're gonna see most often. And I love this ginger liqueur, I love it. I think it's great. So we're gonna do a half ounce of that guy, and then our scotch. Now, some people might be mad at me for putting a really nice single malt Laphroaig into this cocktail with all these other ingredients, uh, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> I, you, can do, you can do whatever you want with the booze that you own or you're going to buy. Um, so this is a single malt scotch. It's gonna be very peaty, very smoky. We're doing an ounce and a half of this in this drink. If you want to make it with a blended scotch, like um, like a Johnny Walker or a famous grouse or you know something cutty sark, you're probably going to want to use two ounces. I'm doing less of the single malt because the flavor is so powerful; it'll it'll kind of overtake everything else. Okay. So we're going to do an ounce and a half. All right. And then the fun part, and then we're gonna shake it. So for this drink, we're actually gonna shake it with uh, cubed ice, just regular cubed ice out of your fridge. If you wanna go ahead and make a um, fancy sphere, large you know, brick cocktail or ice, whatever, you go right ahead. But for, for quarantine at home purposes, regular ice out of the freezer is just fine. All right, so now shake it up. Get a good hard steel on that. And don't smile because it's creepy. <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to double strain this over crushed ice. Okay. All right. Now we're going to double strain. And I'm double straining because I want to get all of the mint out. I don't want any mint like leaves in my drink. I just want it to taste like mint. All right. Now we can do a nice little peel. Where's my white peeler? We'll do a nice little lemon peel on top. And you always want to express the oil from the outside, from the outside of the fruit, whether it's an orange, lemon, grapefruit, whatever. And because you'll see, you'll see all the oil. You can actually see it shoot off into the drink. And it makes you very excited to drink it. And then, whoops, and then I've got a little tiny piece of mint left over. This is out of our garden, and we're, we kind of have a sad mint crop right now. <laughs> All right, and we'll do that. I'll get my my gold bamboo-shaped metal straw. Very nice. And I have the Waltz Nightcap. Wow. Well, thank you so much. It Jeez. sounds really interesting. Oh. Uh, if you could deliver that to Costa Mesa, I'm up till probably midnight tonight. <laughs> Coming at you. Oh, wait, we're going to be in curfew. Sorry. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. We appreciate you stopping by and making a cocktail. And uh, is there anything that you would like to plug uh, before we go? Um, yeah, actually, if you go to my Instagram page, which is Old Man Merrill, in the bio of my Instagram page is a link to an online cocktail book that I was a part of. Oh. Uh, I submitted a couple recipes to that. And there's 20 other bartenders, awesome bartenders. And it's actually a PDF that you can download. It's only 20 bucks. Uh, there's 20 alcoholic recipes, 20 non-alcoholic recipes, and all the proceeds to uh, from this book, all the proceeds go to the bartenders that submitted recipes. Since, you know, I'm really happy that there's so many of our of my 
my peers that are starting to go back to work now as bars slowly start reopening. Uh, but so many of us are still um, still furloughed, uh, you know. So yeah. uh, check it out. It's an awesome cocktail book, and uh, tell all your friends. <laughs> all right. Well, visit Kelly's link. And uh, thank you once more, Kelly. We really appreciate you coming by. My pleasure, Spike. Thank you. All right. Aloha. Aloha. Um, I do have my own personal Tiki cocktail hour, Spike's Breezeway cocktail hour, um, that I do from j like just right, just right over there. And, uh, and it's a weekly series. And I've actually, I've learned a ton from, from Kelly. Uh, some of it unsolicited, but also appreciated because he's like, there was one thing where, where I poured some like pineapple juice and he was like, well, you're not going to shake that before you do it. And I was like, what are you talking about? It was, I guess it was too, cl too clear. So he, he teaches me stuff every time I do something, um, not at a professional level. So and that's the whole goal of my own personal uh, cocktail series is to learn along with everybody who wants to come along for the ride. So every Friday on YouTube, uh, Spike's Breezeway Cocktail Hour, and then I also rebroadcast it on Instagram. So once again, thank you so much, Kelly Merrill, for joining us from Trader Sam's. And uh, hopefully we all get to visit you again real soon at Trader Sam's because I know a lot of us are really really missing the tiki 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 rum and everything that goes along with that i hope you enjoy the show I want to thank you uh for joining us and thank christopher from stellar shows for for hosting this whole thing and keep an eye out on uh stellarshows.net for all the shows that he has coming up have a great sunday and aloha aloha that's our show don't forget to make a visit to the tip jar and a generous donation to support our musicians Sail the day for the islands 